Hello, everyone. Welcome to day two of Microsoft Build Live. We've got a ton of great content to bring you today, coming straight from the Washington State Convention Center in Seattle, Washington. This is your live streaming coverage of Microsoft Build. It begins now. All right, we are here at the Build Live stage. Thank you so much for joining. We've got our studio audience right here. Right, coming up, we're going to be live streaming breakout sessions from Anders Heilsberg with What's New in TypeScript. And James Montemagno will share the next transformation in mobile development with Xamarin. Be sure to send us your questions on Twitter using the hashtag MSBuild or by using the link below. But first, I'm going to be sharing some new things in AKS with Brendan Burns. What is your title? I was going to say benevolent dictator, but what is your uh, Well, I like to claim that I'm a software engineer, but it doesn't happen as much anymore. Uh, my official title is distinguished engineer, which always feels a little silly when I say it. But it's very distinguished, it though. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I feel like I should not be wearing a t-shirt. That's cool. No. Yeah, I, we, I, we, we, we actually matched with the, uh, the bit mapping. I'm I feeling like, the whole 8-bit like, thing. Yeah, it's working for us working. right now. So AKS, I heard that it is the fastest growing compute service right now? Uh, it is the fastest growing compute service right now. So yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely um, been very popular since we GA'd <laughs> uh, almost about a year ago. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, growing like that has its own challenges, which, is, which has been cool. But it's been fun to focus on the core infrastructure and, and that sort of stuff and make sure that we can keep up with it. Um, and it's also great to see the interest, honestly, and, and the way that it's helping people. So let, let me ask you a couple of tough questions, because I've always wanted to hang out with no, you. No, please. Did you have any questions that you thought Kubernetes could grow that big? Was there ever any like, well, maybe, maybe we got into this thing and it was going to be too big? Like, oh, yeah. No, I mean, all, all along, I think there was always the, I mean, you know, the like the standard like hype curve, pit of disappointment and all that. Like there was always the feeling that like it could be exciting and then like everybody be like, oh, yeah, like that's legacy. And I still think that actually. I still think in five years people are going to be like, oh, man, we have that it's legacy. Like, We've got that legacy Kubernetes system we got to get rid of, you know. This, like, that's, a, that's a technology kind of imposter syndrome. Where yeah. I think this is a good idea. Okay, yeah. this is actually working. It's still going. It's, like, yeah. it's really got people excited. It's becoming a piece of the fabric of the Internet. Yeah, and that'll be that'll be the interesting test, I think, in like in five years. Is it is it like Linux? Is it still there twenty years later, or is it you know something that that has passed on? It's an interesting discussion and one that I have all the time actually with the um, with the serverless folks and the people who are sort of focusing on even the higher level layers about whether like where does the cut line draw? Uh, it seems to me that the cut line for cloud is going to happen above the VM. Mm -hmm. Like we're not going to think about VMs eventually, um, but. Does it happen at the Kubernetes layer, the container layer, or does it even go higher? It's a, it's a philosophical discussion at this well, point, but it's interesting. It's a philosophical discussion maybe we can talk a little bit about right here. Because there are, we are talking about self-driving cars, and we have people who are saying, as we get closer and closer to self-driving cars, I want a stick shift. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are people I who love stick there, shift. Well, see? The, you heard it here first. Yes. So here are people who want a fully managed service. They want a self-driving Kubernetes, and yeah. other people might still want to drive stick. Yeah. Yeah, but I don't want, I still like the fact that I have like a fuel injected computer driving the fuel injection. I don't want to be like manually calculating the fuel I'm putting in the engine. Okay, and so then like, just like there's a degree of management squirt that I like. The fuel in yeah, I'm not the like, I don't want to be squirting the fuel in the engine as I drive down the highway. Okay, right. so then discovering the right line for that yeah. both in your car and in your managed Kubernetes yeah. cluster is something you're always thinking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it changes over time, I think, too, right? You know, um, as, as we sort of mature these things and people. People figure out what they need to know and where they want to forget about stuff. Mm -hmm. And the whole point of AKS is that the, if I understand correctly, like the uh, the management plane, you just don't worry about it. Yeah, no, exactly. We run it for you. My uh, engineers are on call. Like, I mean, the, the analogy that I sort of think about is it's like, you know, the difference between running something like SQL Server yourself or running it in Azure SQL. Like, they're both good options for different reasons, and the manual versus automatic and but in one case, somebody else wakes up, and in the other case, you have to wake up if there's a problem and for upgrades and everything else like that. So I think there's a lot of value, especially with Kubernetes, where people are focusing on building applications on top of it. Mm -hmm. There's a real value in being able to focus on your application and not have to worry about the details of, like, how do I install it? How do I upgrade it? Everybody kind of does that once, and then they move on to a managed service. That's interesting. When I, when I first got my driver's license, my parents were like, you have to drive stick first. And they made me drive a stick. I didn't even know like automatic shift cars existed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I did that for a year. And they're like, ha ha, made you look. And then they gave me an automatic. Yeah. I haven't really thought about it since. I had the same thing with power steering. I had to like get my driver's license parallel parking with no power steering. <laughs> it's good for the arms, though. Yeah, and go yeah, all the yeah, way back. Uh, yeah. OK, so then you think that people should do that. They should build maybe a Kubernetes cluster locally or maybe in their, their office. And then f understand it, feel it, and then say, OK, I get it. Let's yeah. let someone else manage that. I mean, I don't know if it's a should, like you, everyone absolutely should, but I think it's should. a good experience. And, and a lot of us like tech 
sort of from a hobbyist perspective and, and enjoy understanding how our systems are built. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've written code in assembly language and, and like, I don't think I've ever had to write code in assembly language, <laughs> but it was fun, you yeah. know? Um, so I think it's good to understand your systems, but also it's good to realize that you should delegate to people when they can develop expertise, right? I can have a team that focuses exclusively on running this system mm. um, and, and scale to thousands and thousands of clusters, whereas if you're running them yourself, you know, even a big company may only have 20 or 30, and so you're just not going to as, have as big a team and, and be as sort of specialized. Right. I always tell people that if, if, you're, if you're a hosting company and like, that's your business, that's your, your, your key value, then sure, do that. But if you're selling insurance, yeah, yeah. why are you tinkering with your Kubernetes cluster? Yeah, no, exactly. exactly. Okay. So you're saying that you, you, this is a managed service that is treated the same as all other managed services on Azure. There's someone else who carries the pager. It's all handled. Yeah. How far away can I abstract myself from AKS? Can I go all the way to the I check in code and it goes live and magic happens? Well, I mean, I think the thing with, with Azure in general is I feel like that sometimes we, we talk about our products because we build our products. But like really, when a, I hope when a customer consumes Azure, they consume the whole platform, mm. right? And so if you're talking about something like that, we integrate with like Azure DevOps. And there's really nice, easy to use integration um, between the Azure DevOps pipelines and the Kubernetes cluster, so you can create that experience. It's not like it's an AKS experience or an Azure DevOps experience. It's an Azure experience um, of the whole thing. But yeah, you can absolutely get to that world where it's you know check-in code and it runs all the way through. And in fact, I, I would suggest that that's where most people should should be, right? Both for reasons of security and compliance, and also for you know uh, agility. Right. So, like as you point out, certainly not part of the fundamentals of AKS, but an op an, an optimal state that one could get into. Absolutely. You just stop thinking about yeah, it. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So, what are some of the brand new things that happened at Build around AKS? So, there's a couple of different things. I mean, we were talking about serverless earlier. Um, a, a while ago, actually, we launched serverless container infrastructure with Azure Container Instances. Um, so you can run a container on Azure without seeing a machine anywhere. Right, so that's been GA'd for a while. Um, here at Build, we're GAing uh, the virtual nodes integration with AKS. So previously, if you ran serverless containers, it was sort of a one-off. It was like running a VM. Like you just ran one container and it existed, but it wasn't really orchestrated. Okay. Um, with virtual nodes, we're integrating the, that serverless container infrastructure with AKS. So you can use the Kubernetes API to orchestrate these serverless containers. But they still, there's no VMs there. They're, they're hypervisor secured. So if, for example, you're, you, know, you have users who are submitting code from the internet to run in your application. Maybe it's a little plug-in in a spreadsheet or any kind of user code. Mm -hmm. You don't want to run that just in a bare Kubernetes cluster because you don't trust that person's code. But with Azure Container Instances, it's run inside a hypervisor. You can securely know that you know, they do whatever they want inside their container, but they can't touch anything else. And with the integration with AKS, you can use that one orchestrator to manage both your code and you know, potentially malicious uh, end user code, or even just code that you don't trust. Right? I mean, we've, we see repeatedly the internet is a scary place. And you know, for a lot of these um, projects, you, know, you, you may want to run it in an isolated environment. Um, also, it's great for burst out, because uh, ACI gives you pretty fast startup and second, per second billing. So people are using it for dev and test. And so that's been GA'd. Um, that's pretty cool to see. The the virtual you said virtual nodes is virtual that nodes, the yeah. is that the kind of the name for the virtual kubelet open source? Project? Yeah, that's the Azure product that we've built around the virtual kubelet project. Mm -hmm. That is a virtual kubelet is a, a cloud native compute foundation project that is done actually in collaboration with a bunch of other partners in the industry. Um, some here in Seattle, some elsewhere. Um, and and so when we take that and we integrate it with AKS and we make it available and supported, um, you know, it's important to distinguish the product name from the project name. And so it's the virtual nodes inside of AKS. Now, you made an interesting uh, kind of throwaway comment there about burst out. It's like yeah. burst out. When you make an AKS cluster, you have a sense of sizing, a general sense of I want it to be about yay big, yeah. right? But with, with Azure Container Instances, you can be making them left and right. Yeah. They're kind of sidecars. They're over here, and they're doing their own thing. Yeah. Uh, with the virtual nodes, you can basically say, I want it to be about yay big, but it could be as big as this. You're saying that that burst comes from ACI? It can. I mean, we, you can also do auto scaling um, depending on sort of how um, how long you expect the burst to come, right? And if how like urgently a, you need the, the right. So, so ACI responds more quickly um, and is really great for transient stuff. So imagine you are like processing images, doing face recognition in images, and generally, you know, one or two images arrive a second, but somebody decides to like upload all their vacation pictures, and you have this giant queue. ACI is a great solution to burst out, 
process through all those images and then immediately come back down and only get charged for handling that burst. Mm. Um, whereas something like, you know, maybe you're running a, a, a site that has a daily, you know, at noon, it's really, there's a lot of traffic and at midnight, there's low traffic. Right. Auto, you know, auto scaling the cluster itself is right. a great solution. Or Black for that. Friday or, or holidays. Black Friday or all those sorts of things. Yeah, those sort, the, you know, that that's the sort of thing where VM-based cluster auto scaling would be a better, probably a better solution because it's more long-standing. Right? You're going to need that capacity for three, four, five hours, not for you know 30 seconds as you blast through a bunch okay. of. Okay. Uh, so the virtual nodes is GA and it can and it can give you that burst out quickly within yeah. you know within less than a minute. It oh can yeah, get you easy. Seconds. Yeah, seconds. And then if you say, oh, this is this is our new steady state, so now yeah. we'll scale now out. But in fact, that's a good pattern too, where you can burst out quickly, and then if you stay there. You know, auto scaling maybe kicks in and scales up your cluster, or you manually scale your cluster up. Yeah. Are you hoping at some point that that all of that abstract will be abstracted away, or is that is that silly to even want? You know, it's it's an interesting question. I think it it goes back to that sort of manual shift analogy of like where does. You well, know, even, I, the, I, even the automatic shift cars have that little thing at the bottom where it's like, ah, I yeah. don't want to fake being in manual shift. Yeah, and and you still can open the hood, you know, and and I think that there is there's still an appetite for people who want to be able to kind of. See into the machines, and 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 I, I over time I suspect that that's going to go away. But again, I think that's a place where we listen to the customer, mm -hmm. um, and you know, as we see interest in hiding more and more of that, then we start thinking about that. Okay. Um, uh, so in addition to that, also in the serverless vein, um, we also announced this project that we did in collaboration with Red Hat called uh, Kata, which is the Kubernetes. Uh, event-driven auto-scaling. Um, and that actually runs on Kubernetes anywhere. Obviously, if we're collaborating with Red Hat, it has to work in OpenShift. It has to work anywhere, not just in Azure. Um, and it's based on the Azure Functions work. So I think the other thing you're seeing with serverless is people are saying, you know, I love something like Functions in Azure, but I'm going to run some workload on-prem, or I'm going to run some workload at the edge where I don't have a service. How can you help me use the same code in both of those places? And so, or, you know, I, I'm using OpenShift on-premise, want to use Azure Functions, too, on top of OpenShift. Um, and in that world, the Azure Functions team has actually open sourced this project where you can use exactly the same code for Azure Functions on the cloud and Azure Functions running on top of Kubernetes anywhere in the world, any cloud, anywhere. Is one of the, uh, this seems to me like the, the move away from our way or the highway at Microsoft is yeah. so fundamental. Is, like, is that one of the reasons that you came to work here? Because it seems like oh, yeah. no, for sure. the, the prescription is, well, what do you want to do? Well, I think another way of saying that is the reality is people are going to run their workload all over the place. And, you know, if you don't give them options, there's lots of great solutions out there, and they're going to find their way somewhere else, right? And I think, I think the other great thing about Microsoft, honestly, is that it has this long history of, of empowering and enabling developers. And, and I think building these projects is part of that too, right? VS Code runs anywhere, right? And why? Because we like to help people be more productive. Mm -hmm. um, and so that DNA is strong, has been strong, and, and definitely is a big part of why, why I ended up over here. Cool. Uh, so we had the virtual nodes was yep. GA. What else has gone? The last interesting thing, and we talked a lot about developers, we're going to have to talk a little bit about enterprise. Um, we actually announced um, policy for Kubernetes and integration with Azure policy. So, you know, I think a lot of people think about things like access control for their clusters, but I think what you're also seeing is people really need um, policy enforcement for their clusters. So it could be as something as simple as, you can only pull images from my private registry. The only way you can express that is through policy. Um, it could be something like, hey, if you're turning up something on the public internet, you need to attach a ticket number of where you went through a security review. So okay. if it's on the public internet, we know that we reviewed that service and it's secure. These are all things that policy can do for you because it looks at the API object you're submitting mm -hmm. um, as you're submitting it, and it will reject it if it doesn't match you know, the, the compliance of your company. So if I understand um, correctly, policy is applying you know, governance rules, business rules. Like These are the rules of our business. Right. These are the expectations. Yeah, and sometimes it's governmental regulation, HIPAA, that kind of stuff. Sometimes it's you know, internal security rules and, or a mix of those. And with the integration with Azure policy, which is available for the Azure APIs, which provides the same kind of stuff for the Azure APIs, you can actually establish it for every AKS cluster that was ever created by your company. So you can just set it once on your subscription or actually even in your tenant. Um, and every cluster that ever gets deployed will have, this, uh, will have these policy rules enforced on those clusters. So that's a real, it's a great way to enable developers to be self-service, but still have the right kind of guardrails to keep your company I, in the place that I it wants to be. I immediately saw the, uh, well, you know, because I'm such a great bowler, right? I, right. I, I, I imagine the, the yeah the little bumpers. inflatable things, the bumpers yes. that you put in. Yeah, yes. exactly. No, I think it's exactly that sort of thing, and it's it's because you want people to be agile and able to do what they need to do in a self-service way, but 
you definitely still need to ensure that user data is secure, privacy is respected, you don't have a big security incident. Like that's critical. So, so as we get to the last uh, minute or so here, uh, where do people go and learn about this? Are there videos that you recommend, or do they just go straight to the docs? Yeah, so if you go to aka.ms slash kas learning, um, that'll get you there. Um, the docs are, are really great. Um, if you're getting on board to Kubernetes for the first time, there's actually a lot of really great community resources at kubernetes.io and, and elsewhere. Um, so those are all great places to get in contact with us. Um, and obviously, there's a booth, too. So if you're here at the conference, That's come, come hang out we with us. We do have a live audience, and yeah. all of them could potentially go out to the booth and check out and talk to the actual engineers. I was the there all day yesterday. I'll be there later today. So yeah, absolutely. That's pretty slick. Yeah. See, cool. now I feel like I need to go and put my own cluster up. I went and built my Raspberry Pi cluster. Yeah. I need to upscale that to AKS now. Yeah, AKS. Or uh, you, know, you can build a little hardware cluster, you know, wheel it around. It's, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> I have one in my basement. So you have a, you have a I do. I have a basement. little. It's made out of the Nux, the what are the Intel next oh, unit yeah. of computing. The, the next, like, yeah, next unit of computing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's really cool. cool. Yeah, yeah. Everyone should have a Kubernetes cluster in their home. I think everyone should. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Pretty much. Actually, pretty soon everybody will. I for think. the kids. No, I think everybody will eventually. It's going to come in in your refrigerator. Fantastic. Oh. I appreciate you. Thanks for hanging out with me. For yeah, absolutely. Brandon, for awesome. Thanks.